Raina Troy Hotline. Alicia, Michael, what's going on? We know you have takes. We have takes. I'm actually surprised that your rant line, raid line, whatever, isn't completely full. Why can't we just win a game? Can I blame Michael Castillo for this? Can I blame Bob Connolly for this? Can I put on a zebra shirt and just go out there? Scratch. Claw, up against the wall. I can't explain it, what I'm feeling right now, guys. I can't believe it. Let's open up that race Woohoo! Oh, I can't believe USC has hired Lincoln Riley. Oh, yeah! Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Rain of Joy Radio. This is the car caster for USC's 36 36- 27 loss in Eugene to the Oregon Ducks. We're going to give you our reactions and so much more here on this episode. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at Reign of Troy, like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Reign of Troy, email address Reign of Troy at Phone number 818 643 Suck at Woods Bruin Show. I'm your host, Mike Castillo, journal with my co host in the Ranch Troy studio in Los Angeles, Lisa Deratola. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, this was a weird game, right? This was the worst kind of weird game. I, like I, oh, we I were, liked it better when USC was losing thirty-six to fourteen or third to twenty, whatever it was. Like I liked it better when USC was from, losing from a discussion standpoint of yeah, like from just a well, that's it. But then they do the then the, then they do the thing where they come back and make it close, and it just the, reminds the teaser rally. It just reminds me of how annoyed I am that USC is seven and four this season because they couldn't beat beatable teams. Like I was thinking about that while I was getting our our, our water and stuff. Like it would be better if USC was just Penn State losing to Michigan and Ohio state because they're just not as good as Michigan or Ohio state. Right. It would be better if it was Penn state being in a situation where, uh, they're just not going to win the big 10 because they're just never going to be the better team in the big 10. Instead, what USC does is lose these games to teams that are supremely beatable, that there's no reason. Well, there is a reason and it's a very good and obvious reason why USC isn't winning these games and isn't um, isn't in the chase for the Pac-12 title, isn't in the chase for a college football playoff, all of that, because they just can't beat these teams that are beatable. These aren't Georgia. These Oregon and Washington and Utah and Notre Dame, they are not Georgia. And yet USC goes out and and finds ways to lose and finds ways to look embarrassing against these teams and it is so very very frustrating i i I preferred it when usc was getting jiggle bagged yeah but it it was not a jiggle bag it was a game in which sc almost had a valiant comeback uh this was almost going to be like caleb williams uh heisman moment part two or something um uh, if you somehow did not watch the game, uh, it looked like it was <laughs> going. Doing here? It 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 looked like it was going to be uh, a total jiggle bag, and then SC kind of came. It, SC was down thirty six to fourteen. Uh, our friend uh, Kenny uh, texted us and was like, "You know, this is technically garbage time according to the advanced metrics. Twenty two points in the fourth quarter, and then SC scored the last thirteen points of the game." Uh, I think the moment that I think that we have to discuss, and this is from including a super chat here we got from West Texas Mike uh, that says, I'm literally blocking people on Twitter who are pro going for two before you need the two. They're a cult and I need, and they need to be driven from the game. Well, SC scores. <sighs> You're in good company, West Texas Mike. SC scores um, with three minutes and 44 seconds to go to pull within nine. They need a touchdown and three points after touchdown, which means a, uh, an extra point and a two point conversion. SC opts to go for the two point conversion right out of the gates for some reason. Um, 
and I know there's this was this happened in the Penn State Michigan game too. There is this cry from the analytics side of things, and I'm pro analytics in like 99% of instances, but this one ain't it. That oh, going for two is the right call because uh, the numbers say say that it is. Yeah, because the numbers factor in the chance of you going for two on the last play of the game to win the game, and yes. If you don't go for two the first time, you can't go for two the second time to potentially win the game on the last play of the game. 100%. Yes, that's accurate. That's why those numbers exist. But when you're down 15, your job is to not lose. Give yourself your you want to live another day. Yes. Your job is to get, do to reduce the number of possessions that you are behind. And when you're down nine points, you kick the, you take the kick, you take the one point, you make it eight and you go for two at the very end when you need it the most, especially when we know what SC is on two point conversions. SC is terrible on two point conversions. That's what pisses me off. It is 10 games into the season. It is 11 games into the season. It is 11 games into the season. Play to your strengths. Have you been a, a good two-point conversion team this year? No. No, you have been a terrible two-point conversion team this year. Yeah. Th this goes along with fourth downs, with all of these other decisions that you made. It's, it's fine in the early part of the season if you're sort of gauging where are we at. If you're bad at fourth downs, don't go fourth downs. If you're bad at two-point conversions, which, by the way, USC is bad at two-point conversions, don't go for the two-point conversion. Yeah. Yeah, and so SC misses it, and now what would have been an eight-point game if you make the field goal is now nine, which means it's now two possessions yet again, and there's three minutes left in the game. There's not time for two possessions, so you've lost the game. Yeah. And I understand the idea that, well, you need to get one two-point conversion at some point, and we could also go into the, the fact of, like, SC was never going to get the stop on defense anyway, so it's all moot. That's a valid argument that we can talk about, absolutely. Um, but the whole point is when you're down is to not lose the game and to extend your life in the game. You extend the game by kicking the PAT and getting it to eight points. You keep yourself in the game at a one-possession buffer and yes I, I i wouldn't have bet sc to to get the two-point conversion on the last play of the game if they needed it to tie the game but like that's the that's the better alternative to missing it now and then never getting that shot if oregon fumbles the kickoff if oregon fumbles the the ball on their last drive if you get the defensive stop or whatever you have to prepare as if you're going to do those things yeah and i know that you know Nobody had faith in USC's defense and nobody had faith that you're going to recover an onside kick because recovering an onside kick is a fraction of a coin flip. But you have to prepare as if you're going to. And you have to, like, try to only do that one time if possible. Yeah, and it's stupid that I feel this strongly about this decision when USC was losing the game anyways. Yeah. I'm very confident that USC was not going to get the ball back for a second possession, whether they kicked the PAT or went for two. But I am pissed off about this stupid two-point conversion decision because I am still pissed off at the two-point conversion decisions that cost USC a game potentially against, uh, well, against Utah. Utah. SC would have been in overtime it was if it wasn't for chasing points in the third quarter. SC would have been SC nearly loses the Cal game because they chase points. Uh, and then they would have been up 10 points in the last drive, but there were only up seven, uh, yes. all because of SC chasing two point conversions, which is because SC has struggled at two point conversions all season, which is a broader issue that I realize that I am angry about. That is a much broader issue than this one microcosm of a situation, which is number one, Coaches around college football do this all freaking Saturday, and it pisses me yeah. off. Penn State, James Franklin did it, and it probably didn't matter because his team was probably still going to lose that game. But like, if you had a chance, you screwed yourself over with this, and it annoys me that the, the coaches around the country screw themselves over with this every single week, every single window of watching college football. Somebody is making this stupid decision, and it pisses me off. 
But beyond that, beyond that, it's the question of what is USC going to be going forward? Because guess what? The season is over except for rivalry pride against UCLA. Yeah. Which definitely still matters, especially against the UCLA team that exists right now, that if USC loses to that UCLA team, I'll have thoughts about that. But the thing that annoys me is that, like, if these games actually were close enough to matter, if USC was riding or dying on these decisions, these would be horrendous decisions that are counting against a coach who is starting to feel ridiculously embattled in year two at USC. And it's like, I want to sit here and defend Lincoln Riley. I want to sit here and, and battle back against the craziness of people saying that USC needs a new head coach or any of those things. Yeah. And it gets really hard when he's doing this bullshit. <sighs> Calma. I know. Calma. I know. Yeah, it's... Um... And as Irvine Cattle Ranch in the, thing, in, in the chat says, why didn't he call the timeout before that, that big delay of game? Yeah. Yeah, it's those kinds of things. It's those kinds of things that need to get cleaned up. And I, and I understand that my whole thing on these things is watching college football around the country. Yeah. Everybody is screwing up their timeout decisions. Everyone is screwing up their two point conversion decisions. As I made clear earlier, Mm -hmm. everyone is making the wrong decisions on fourth downs. Everyone looks sloppy. Everyone looks like the margin between the teams that, aren't having those problems and the teams that are is uh, I, I think everyone is making these stupid mistakes. The bigger difference is whether or not your offense and your defense are good enough to make them not be the things that ultimately cost you in a game Mm -hmm. because a team like Georgia is also making these kinds of stupid, silly mistakes. A team like Alabama is also making these stupid kind of silly mistakes, but they're good enough on offense and on defense to make it not be an issue. Right. Um, And so like that, that's the bigger thing to me is that if your defense was good enough to get a single stop when you needed it in this game, we wouldn't necessarily be having these conversations. If your offense, if your offensive line specifically was good enough to have your, your offense rolling in this game and competitive in this game, then we wouldn't necessarily be having to talk about two point conversions because you'd be scoring touchdowns when you needed them earlier in the game, all of those things. Right. But on the fine margins, when you look forward to like, the games that might actually matter for USC where you can't expect your kids to be perfect. You can't expect your coaches to be perfect. You can't expect anything to be perfect. Mm -hmm. I want to at least feel semi-confident in the game management decision of the head coach that I have decided to put my faith in so that I don't absolutely lose my mind. And it is, It makes me lose my mind when then they turn around and do the one thing that I have been screaming at every other coach for all damn day to then turn around and do the same thing. This was the cherry on top of a frustrating day in terms of Alicia watching college football. So I'm a little bit peeved Um, and it's ultimately irrelevant and I get that, but I'm still peeve because it, it it adds to the pile on that I'm going to need to then spend the next 10, nine, 10 months fighting against because I am an optimist at heart and I'm going to be supporting Lincoln Riley at heart through the next, uh, yeah. the, the start of the 2024 season. And I'm not excited about it. Yeah. I, I, th- I think the interesting thing is I, you know, to your, to your point about, you know, if this just would have been a jiggle bag and, getting on here when it's 36 to 14, I I think the conversation would have been different. Um, And, you know, uh, it's, it's, I I understand the ridiculousness of like being upset about the two point conversion thing, uh, because I think that's, I think it's worth mentioning that SC showed a lot of heart here. This was not a good performance in the sense of, SC got absolutely owned on both sides of the line of scrimmage. They had no schematic advantage for most of this game. They had, they were losing every single battle that you could think of. And they still found a way uh, to 
bring it what should have been within a possession at the end of the day. And I, I think that's a testament to the efforts of Caleb Williams. I think it's a testament to the scrappiness um, of this offense, even when things are not going their way, even when the offensive line is not getting push, even when all the pressure of the defense not getting stops weighs down on them, they were able to find a way to get it with what should have been a one possession score at the end of the game, which is a testament to that, right? Like this was not like SC in a lot of ways was outclassed in this game for sure. When you look at, you know, how they were beaten on the line, uh, they get another, another day in which they give up 500 yards. Bo Nix was basically throwing routes on air where not a single, I don't think a single pass was contested until like the fourth quarter. Um, the, the one that Damani Jackson almost makes an interception on, mm-hmm. um, inside the, the five yard line. It was the only time I can even think of, of a pass where there was a defender even close to where the target was. So the, the defensive performance was atrocious. Um, and yet, you know, Oregon had a sloppy day. I thought, um, uh, Oregon committed uh, 13 penalties for 120 yards. They did not turn the ball over. And if they would have, I think it would have given SC a chance to really sort of do, do something. The only turnover was SC's, uh, the fumble that, you know, took away an opportunity. And maybe you look at it and say, well, if SC wouldn't have turned it over there, if they would, they had a, uh, you know, untimely punts earlier in the game, like if they if those things. But again, you're when the defense is this bad, you're practically asking your offense to be perfect, which is especially difficult when you're getting you know just roasted on on the offensive line. And Angelo in the chat says the game wasn't really that close. And yeah, like in most like yeah, I, like you look at the numbers, SC was outgained by almost 200 yards. Um, you look at yards per play, Oregon was at 8.8, which is almost a full pl- I think that is a, a full yard more than what Washington had last week. And we know how bad that defensive performance was. It's not like SC got stops in this game. Uh, they got three stops. Two of those were field goal attempts. And the other one was a three and out. So it's not like SC got a million stops in this game. Instead, this was a game that didn't have a lot, like both teams, like the, the pace of game was, was bizarre. I think that was the only reason why this wasn't a score that was in the fifties because you know, the, the first two drives of that third quarter, uh, Oregon's first drive took almost seven minutes and SC's took four. Like the, the game sort of went away that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh that's that's the frustrating thing about this game is that I think USC was out of the game defensively no matter what. Yeah. There were things about this defensive performance that felt better than what we saw from, from USC pre-Grinch, but they were never going to be enough mm. to over... Mm. The run mm. fits the play of the linebackers, I think just across the board, the front seven was better than we had seen from pre-Grinch. But it's only slightly better and not enough to overcome the the broader, bigger issues. There were also down issues. a ton of dudes. Yeah, I mean, the Gentry secondary... Gentry didn't play. Um, the, the secondary... Jalen Smith. There were a, bun- a bunch of guys that did not play today. They had Makai Lemon having to fill in yeah. because they were out of DBs. So... Like, I get it. I get it. But even then, but even then, you know, Damani Jackson is a five-star prospect who has been a starter all year for you. Why is he getting burned like that? Max Williams and Kalen Bullock are veteran starters for you, and they were at the scene of the crime most of the time. So, like, Mm -hmm. defensively, USC was always going to lose this game. No matter what, I'm, I'm fairly confident Lincoln Riley could make every two-point conversion decision right he could make every fourth down call right Mm -hmm. caleb williams could have played a perfect game uh the offensive line could have played a a, a better game the running backs the wide receivers everybody could have done their job and usc would still lose this game 
because defensively well, they were not going to get the stops that they need. I I, th- I think you can make the argument. Yeah, I, I think that SC you can make the argument that SC's best chance was to ugly up this game the way that they did. Yeah, because even if like let's even if USC gets closer, Oregon just takes the ball and right and responds. Yeah, because there was no response on the mm-hmm. defensive side it was just it's yeah. not gonna happen which is, and is the, it is what it is the, like the only way the only reason that this could have been a one score game at the end was because Lanning went for it on two two point conversions twice and which, missed by the way stupid decision by him well uh, okay so it's funny you mentioned that because i have a, another point here but because of that and then they the the missed field goal right like those were five points um off this off the board that Oregon could have you know rode to being in a comfortable spot and almost almost covering right um but here's why like I don't mind Dan Lanning going for two because he's not going for two chasing points. I mean, the he's sec- just doing it. He's just doing he it to do it. Yeah. And I think I like that better because that's just being aggressive. And then at the same time, look what it does to the game. You end up putting Lincoln Riley in a place where now he has the opportunity to think about going for two in that moment, right? If they never chase those points and um, it's what, 31? It would have been 30, uh, what, uh, what would, well, it would have been 38. So I, I guess it wouldn't have mattered because it would have been a 10 point lead, but let's just say hypothetically that whatever it was like the, the weird, the weird score, you end up with 36, which is a weird football number. And by having a weird football number creates a, a moment to where on the other side, you, you end up having to be aggressive to try to make up the that weird number obviously if you would have just made everything like Oregon would have ideally wanted they wouldn't have been in reach but i don't know there's there's some weird weird art art to it that i don't mind i don't mind just being aggressive uh but sc's going going forward on two point conversions has not just been aggressive and sc is two of seven this year which if the like the national average is like something like 40 something 50% on two point conversions SC is so far under that that there's a good reason why SC shouldn't be going for two point conversions as much as they do. So yeah, I mean it's it's all philosophical and I I agree with you that it's less egregious when Lanning does it because Lanning is doing it because it's part of a broader philosophical decision. Right. And Lincoln is doing it because he's chasing points and that's the worst reason to do it. Yeah. Uh so that's that's all, but that's all beside the point because USC's defense was just never going to be good enough in this game because mm-hmm. USC's defense is just flat out horrific. And, yeah. and I don't know what else we can say about it. We talked uh, in, in the preview about potential ways that USC could maybe get a, a little bit of an edge defensively. And those were pretty much taken away by injuries. Eric Gentry is not available. So mm-hmm. I, I did like that they, that they, went with Raylan Goforth and I think that might be not really go forth saying um with uh R- R- Davis. Davis. Uh Raylan Goforth is on my mind because I looked at his pro football focus grades today while I was watching Washington play earlier in the day. And he is a really, really good example of a player who um USC's coaches just like if you wanna if you want to put into perspective USC the job that USC's defensive coordinators, defensive coaches have done over the last handful of years. Raylan Goforth is a really, really good example because Raylan Goforth was basically unplayable as a linebacker for USC last year and the year before. Uh, And he transfers to Washington, a Washington defense that isn't all that good, by the way. And his pro football focus scores just ramp up by like 20, 20 points. And it's just the product of being on a defense that even not a good defense is still not a catastrophic defense the way that USC's defense is catastrophic. But I did like the way that they they gave Rachel Davis a chance, and I appreciated that. Um, but in the secondary, you know, I talked about, like, experiment with Jalen Smith. If you can't play Max Williams and you can't play Bryson Shaw, 
maybe Jalen Smith can play safety. Well, he's out. Um, you know, I, t- I talked about how, like, maybe you plug in at corner, you plug in Jacoby Covington. Well, yeah. he's out. Well, maybe you try Sierra Wright again. Like, Sierra Wright was getting pass interference penalties left and right, but at least he was close enough to a receiver to get a pass interference penalty. Yeah. Well, he's out too. So, uh, you know, I... Uh, there's not there's not really anything more that we can say about the defense. The defense is just bad. And the and the defense being bad, I think negatively impacts everything else that's going on with this team. Mm-hmm. I think USC's offense is overly reliant on Caleb Williams to make a play. Yeah. Because they know that they have to make a play every game. Like Caleb Williams has to go into every play thinking he has to be Superman because he knows that the defense is not going to bail him out at any point. Yeah. And Zachariah Branch on special teams knows that he has to break a touchdown if he's going to have an impact in the game because the defense isn't going to flip, you know, the USC needs a special teams contribution in order to potentially have a chance to win the game. And he fields kickoffs that he shouldn't be fielding and he puts USC's offense in even worse position than they were, than they were already going to be by doing by making those bad decisions but all of the bad decisions that I'm seeing on offense on special teams to me are all very much linked to how utterly catastrophic and embarrassing and just untenable USC's defense is so it's <sighs> I don't know. It, it's just, it's hard to even take anything from this game knowing that, aside from the fact that if USC didn't have a catastrophic defense, this is a very winnable game. And so is Washington, so is Utah, and so is Notre Dame. Yeah, but you do have that defense. And uh, I hate when people say that, you know, so and so without this player is, um, is not good enough. Um, yeah, but. They do have that player. Yeah. And I think the same thing is, and that player is Caleb Williams. Yeah. If you didn't have Caleb Williams, SC would have a losing record. Yeah, but they do have Caleb Williams. Yeah. But the flip side is, if you didn't have this defense, SC probably wins last week. They probably beat Utah. They, they, I don't know that they beat Oregon, but it's at least, it's it's at least a different game, right? And maybe they're sitting here nine and two and uh maybe the notre dame game it's the the one that you who whatever at this point right like maybe you're at nine and two with a better defense right but they do have that defense so like this they are what they are at this point right like they they just are um and you can't fix everything in a week when you fire a defensive coordinator we talked about it before when lincoln riley fired uh mike stoops in 2018 Oklahoma's defense got considerably worse. Um, SC's defense against Washington was about as bad as it could be. So there wasn't a lot of room to get worse. Uh, but when you look at those first two drives that Oregon had in this game, uh, I, I guess it maybe they maybe it was possible to be worse. But um, I'm looking at the the quotes and the post game press conference and. Uh, Lincoln Riley said that they had players play tonight that were probably playing at 70% health. Um, and that this was, uh, he's never quite been in a game with so many banged up players, including some guys that probably from an ability to help the team standpoint. So yeah, I, I, it was, they were always up a huge, huge, um, up against a huge task this week. Um, especially, when you add in uh, the injuries and you add in the opponent, you add in the venue, you add in all the pressure that that defense creates to the offense. Um, it was always likely to go South. Uh, and I think it's a credit to SC's players, uh, especially Caleb Williams, that people are going to wake up tomorrow who didn't watch this game and look at the score and think that, you know, that was a valiant effort from SC that covered the spread they they didn't you know they didn't get completely blown off the ball to the point of at least as the scoreline goes. I think I think so. there's there's definitely something to be said for not letting this game get out of hand. Yeah, because when USC goes scoreless in the third quarter, uh, this game could have gotten 
really could have gotten out of hand. Right. And they didn't. They fought back 13 points in the fourth quarter. Um, yeah. I will continue to say that as much as I don't enjoy watching most of this team play football, mm-hmm. they're not giving up. Yeah. They are trying. I mean, on defense, like those do, they're trying. There's no one quitting. And we've watched USC teams quit in the past. So I'll give them that. Um, it's just, yeah. it's just tough when, even when they're not quitting, the product on the field is so very not it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Murray in the chat says no excuses, Michael. I'm, I'm not making any excuses for this team, right? Like the, the defense is bad. Yeah. And like, even if they were healthy, I don't think they're stopping Bo Nix anyway. So like, I definitely not don't think so. That's, a, that's yeah, the, so, thing that, the thing that you have to understand and you have to recognize and you have to, to put um, in the context of this game is even if USC was playing well, even if USC went into this game undefeated, yeah. even if USC felt like a national title contender, mm-hmm. you still go into a game in, at Autzen and you can't expect to win. Yeah, Most teams don't go into Autzen and win. Yeah. Uh, so in that context, the fight that USC put up here is, is pretty valiant and it is admirable and that's not an excuse that's that's not making excuses for what we can all see in front of us as being a defense that is as i i i keep saying the word but there is no better word catastrophic right yeah and an offense that is not good enough to make up for it catastrophic and Un, you're unable to make the changes in season especially when you have the injuries especially when you've made a coaching change and yeah. all those things like you, it, it sucks. And, and it sucks that SC is in a position where they've lost four or five that they're, they're in a free fall and all these things, but like you just need to get to the off season. Like that's the, it's the only way it's going to get fixed is in the off season. You can't fix it at this point. You have what you have. Uh, it's, it's a lot like soccer. You got to wait till the transfer window. Um, you have what you have. And, SC just doesn't have what they have right now, especially on defense. Um, Irvine Cattle Ranch gave us a um, a super chat. So thank you. Says, thank you once again. I really appreciate the show. We appreciate you guys. Uh, you guys are awesome. We couldn't do this without you, and we couldn't do this without DraftKings, of course, who's running a new promotion that you won't want to miss. New users can place a $5 bet to instantly claim 200 bucks in bonus bets and this is the last weekend to get this offer. You'll also be rewarded with a separate no sweat single game parlay every single day when you opt in. All you have to do is sign up with our code Rain of Troy. Using the code Rain of Troy not only helps you get these great bonuses, but also directly supports this podcast. So if you've been considering signing up for DraftKings, make sure to use the code Rain of Troy to maximize your first bets and parlays. This offer, of course, is only available to new users who are 21 plus and physically present in legal gambling states. Please remember to always gamble responsibly and check the episode description for the full terms of the offer uh, to see if you qualify. Uh, The offer ends November 13th. So it's the last opportunity. Use the code Reign of Troy uh, over at uh, DraftKings. Uh, But Alicia, we got a bunch of questions in the chat. So let's get to those. You've got mail. All right, uh, let's start with uh, the LRT 5-6. If this USC team loses to UCLA, is the fire Lincoln-Riley question going to get bigger? Um, will it get bigger from, uh, from other people? Sure. Yeah, we already have people in our chat saying fire Lincoln-Riley, and I think those people are um, insane, with all due respect. But... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, no, if, if he loses to UCLA, it's 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 not good. It's not a good reflection of this football team. Yeah. Um, especially this UCLA team. Last year's UCLA team with Dorian Thompson Robinson in that offense uh was a, a really a really tough out. 
and USC made their way through and and ended up beating them in, in a in a in a barn burner. Mm-hmm. This UCLA team is kind of reeling, and they don't have an identity, and they have a better, oh, significantly better defense, but their offense is completely discombobulated. They don't know what they're about. Chip Kelly is embattled. And it comes down to winning your rival. You can't lose to Notre Dame the way that USC lost to and also lose to UCLA Mm -hmm. and not have it impact. I wouldn't say your job security, but your perception as a, as a coach. And this season, you know, I, I, we have another question that was asking about like disappointments, which we'll get to, but I was thinking about like the 2012 season and how frustrating that season was because USC USC lost to Oregon and Notre Dame. Those were top five teams, and that's one thing. But they also lost to a UCLA team that wasn't that, that wasn't anything particularly exceptional, and they they lost to an Arizona team that wasn't anything particularly exceptional, and they lost to a Georgia Tech team that wasn't particularly exceptional. And um, it was those losses that I have much bigger issue with than failing to outpace Oregon an Oregon team that put up 62 points or failing to, to beat Notre Dame in the rain when you had uh, uh, a backup quarterback or, you know, all of the, the, the context of those games, it was the, it was the other games that I, that I take issue with. So if you, if you sort of look at this season, you'll see lost to a ranked Notre Dame team and a ranked Utah team and a ranked Washington team and a ranked Oregon team. I don't like those losses, but I understand why they happened and I can stomach them, but you can't lose to the six and four UCLA team that can't score 15 points on anybody. Yeah. Uh, That's, that's where it sort of comes down to how much fight does this team have? Because the thing that we continue to credit this team with is that they are fighting, that they are still out there trying. And to me, the way that you lose to UCLA is if you lose that, if you, if you are no longer, um, putting in the effort if you are no longer making uh, at least trying. And that would be a much, much bigger red flag to me than losing to Oregon at Autzen when you have no defensive coordinator and a defense that was already bad and was never going to get much better than it than the bad that it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OVLO in the chat says, is it insane to to – Want to fire Lincoln Riley? It is absolutely um, insane to want to fire Lincoln Riley. OVLO says, we almost lost to Colorado, Cal, and Zona. This has to be the, one of the worst teams with the best depth, depth charts. Um, and also mentions the the uh, $11 million salary thing. Um, every coach, every high-ranking coach makes a lot of money. I, I understand I, why the money thing is, is a sticking point for people, but like, he's making 11 million because you had to go pry him away from Oklahoma because he was, this was the best hire as he could have got at the time. Um, and like I Lincoln Riley has never failed. Like he is failing this year ever. And so, yeah, like this is not, this is not a good position for him. I don't think that this year looks good on him. I don't think that he, he obviously, is having to deal with the decision of keeping Grinch and having it completely implode the season. And I think he will be in battle to the point of having to overcome that going forward. But like, and you know, have you, have you looked at Jimbo Fisher? Like the, the season that SC is having right now, Jimbo Fisher has done six times at Texas, at Texas A&M. With and he's isn't he making even more money? Like, yeah. like I understand the the frustration and but like Lincoln Riley has never failed this bad before. And if he loses to UCLA, it's absolutely there needs to be a lot of questions, even more questions about him going forward. Um, and next season needs to be one that you see improvement. You need to see. Uh, improvement on the off- offensive side of the ball in addition to defense. Absolutely. But it's it's the only time he's ever failed this badly. Like, let, 
I just uh, okay. Let's we're gonna we're gonna have deep breath. We're gonna have this conversation. We're just gonna have it. Um, who did you want USC to hire last year instead of Lincoln Riley? Was it Luke Fickle, the coach who is currently five and four at a Wisconsin team that uh, you know went seven and six the year before, not four and eight like uh, like USC had uh, had done? Um, do do you want uh, Matt Campbell? Over at Iowa State, have you seen what Matt Campbell has done recently? That was the other option. Hey, technically, to be fair, um, Iowa State controls their destiny in the Big, in the big yeah. 12. Yeah, good good for them. Uh, would you want to, as Angelo brought up in the chat, would you want Dave Aranda, the the, the coach that just got, you know, jiggle back? He was one Kansas of the names State? that we talked about two years ago as a head coach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want uh, James Franklin? Do you want James Franklin? Because Penn State doesn't. Penn State's fans don't. Um, who are who are who are the big names? Who are the big names on the coaching carousel that y'all want over Lincoln Riley? Um, where I stand on this is everyone who is in a big rush to have to fire the head coach and move on to a new head coach. Do you understand? That if you end up in a position where you need to fire your head coach again, you are in a 50-50 proposition at best to hire a head coach who is worse than Link than uh, than Clay Helton. Not not worse than Lincoln Riley, worse than Clay Helton. 50-50 at best. Yeah. Well, because- especially when if you let's just say that you you fired Lincoln Riley after he loses to UCLA, or even 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 simpler. Lincoln Riley goes to the NFL. Yeah. Are you in a better situation? The, the coach that you are hiring will come in with a track record that is almost guaranteed to be worse than Lincoln Riley's track record coming in. And, and maybe that's fine because again, it's there's, I've talked about this for every single year that I've been on this podcast, which is like 11 seasons. Now there's two ways to judge a hire in the moment. You judge the hire and you judge the tenure. The USC hire of Lincoln Riley was the best hire they possibly could have done. The way the tenure has gone out has not been up to par yet. Those two things do not have to be competing against each other because they were two completely different things. We talked about it a million times over with Chip Kelly over at UCLA. The best possible hire they could have made. A hire that has not panned out for them. Right? Arizona with Jed fish. We all thought it was a terrible hire that they hired Jed fish. It is working out for them, right? Like hiring coaches is not a, not a foolproof science. If it was every freaking blue blood wouldn't be firing their coach every two or three years or whatever it is. Like they wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the position where coaches get fired now. Like they didn't, they never have been before. Like this is a completely different landscape of college football now because the money isn't is is so prevalent, and because of yeah the the expectations that are that are put out on coaches and on teams and on players and all these things. So yeah, it's it's. I just think the grass is definitely always greener on the other side, and I am willing to ride this ride with a Lincoln Riley who yeah. is at least winning seven games in his losing seasons, winning seven games in his, in his, this is the worst we've ever seen a uh, USC play kind of seasons when it's very, very, very clear to me that the issue is on the defensive side of the ball, not his own side of the ball, which is, which is what my complaint about like Clay Helton was always that, Clay Hilton was an offensive coach and he was never an elite offensive coordinator. So when USC's offenses were pretty mediocre the whole way through, it was like, well, what is going to get fixed? Cause right. your head coach isn't going to, isn't going to do that at the very least. I still feel confident that USC will be able to lean on a Lincoln Riley offense going forward. And he now needs to make the D the right DC hire. He gets to make that hire, yeah. which is, the second DC hire he's ever made in his career. He got the first one wrong with Alex Grinch, arguably the second because he kept Grinch when he came to USC, but not to beat that horse to a pulp, but like 
I got why that was the case. I I got why that was the decision. Um, but you you come into to year two at a program that had won what was four and eight and was drifting yeah. before that four and eight. Uh, you take it over and you exceed all expectations in year one, winning eleven games in year one, massively exceeding expectations. Yeah. And then in year two, the chickens come home to roost because guess what? Your offensive line, that hole that you were put in by the previous regime on the offensive line, is a giant gaping hole that you can't fill by by getting transfers. And the defensive coordinator that you hired, uh, that you that you thought could turn things around fell flat on his face and utterly failed. Yeah. Well, okay, that happened. Your worst case scenario happened in 2020, in 2023. And you're still bowl eligible and you still get to go out there and see if you can win your rivalry game against UCLA and then go forward and make a change at coordinator, make make a, a change at defensive coordinator, bring in somebody who can turn things around and then see where you go from there. Yeah. But it's really critical to me that you that you that I take and I would encourage everyone else to take a see where you go from here sort of mentality, because if you are ready to to write off the head coach after two seasons. I will continue to say this, you will be miserable, you will be utterly miserable for the rest of time. Or I would yeah. encourage you to go buy some Georgia gear and just say, fine, I am a Georgia fan because I cannot be happy unless I know that I have a national title winning head coach who is at the peak of his prowess or I will be utterly miserable. Like, yeah. I, I just, I think that's, that's sort of where I'm at with, with, with all of this. Um, it's a it's a complex situation that USC is in. They made the best possible hire they could have made. Uh, they are dealing with the remnants of the previous regime that left the cupboards somewhat bare, and some bad decisions that are on Lincoln Riley. One million percent, yeah. he made the decision to bring back Alex Grinch, and that burned him this yeah. year. Because if he didn't, if he had a better, better defensive coordinator, USC is is has two losses at worst, I would say. Mm -hmm. And you, you might still be looking at this season as a disappointment if you're not competing for a national title, but it's certainly yeah. in a different sort of phase. So I, I just, I, I feel like, I feel like people have sort of forgotten how the college football scope tends to usually have worked because of the heightened things like expectations and stuff like that. But because usually it works Year one guy comes in. You just have a year one. It's a feeling out period year two. You want to be the growth year. And if you don't have growth, well then you fire your coordinators and year three is the referendum. And if it's not good by year three, you move on. That's usually how things go. That's, that's the standard boilerplate way of going to going in these directions. And SC had a weird year last year in which they had a schedule that was advantageous. They ended up going 11 and one, uh, in the regular season. They, uh, they, they performed maybe, maybe not completely overachieved, but they were ahead of schedule in a, in a lot of ways, right? Like you don't expect your coach to come in in year one and go 11 and one in the regular season. Right. And so now they were in a, in a spot where now the, the schedule is much harder and the defense got worse and they couldn't overcome those things. They couldn't get back to that same level. So then you should go back to what the original boilerplate response that we have, the, the normal college football rubric, which is okay. Year two, it, you had struggles. Okay. You fire your, your coordinators and now you see what, now you see what happens. Like, and that that's, what's going to happen. That Like that's, that's what's going to happen. Uh, Kenny in the chat said, um, uh, something I thought was was really good here. I think it's perfectly reasonable to a not like Lincoln Riley in the moment, and be extremely disappointed, but b think you obviously do not need to fire him. Yeah, I, I would agree. And then the other thing, I I think Oregon is a prime example of what can we talked about it. You know, a couple of weeks ago that like UCLA's defense is an example of like what can happen with a coordinator change. I think 
Oregon is a prime example of what can happen with transfers. Um, they, so yes, SC struggled, um, this year defensively. We can talk about how they don't have the bodies. They don't have this. They don't have that. They tried to go out there and get the transfers. Like, uh, we saw on the, on the defensive line with bear Alexander and, uh, Anthony Lucas and Sullivan and, uh, Solomon bird from last year. And then they get Mason Cobb this past year, all those guys. Right. And it hasn't really panned out, save for save for Bear Alexander, right? But this Oregon defense is one of the best in the country, and it's almost all transfers on defense. So after last year, giving up twenty seven points per game, they they, were, they weren't they a were good an defense. Defense yeah, last year, they weren't a good defense. And I do not think that T- Tosh Lupoy is a is a great defensive coordinator. Um, like if, if you, I would not, he would not be someone that I would say that SC should go higher. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but Dan Lanning obviously has his input there, but like they were able to do things with transfers. And so I think there is a pathway forward. You can hit on transfers like Oregon did. If you can get the impact on defense, like UCLA did, uh, with the defensive coordinator higher you can be right back to where you want to be next year. And we can talk about how also, and I know I've made this point a million times in the last two weeks, but yes, uh, SC maybe doesn't have the NFL bodies on the, on the, on the line. And that might be a problem when you face say Michigan or Georgia or whomever, but at the same point, would you take S uh, there's, there's teams with, with inferior rosters to what SC has now, and they're outperforming SC on defense. Mm-hmm. So just being better schematically and coaching wise is so much more important, uh, or is at least the most important thing just to be better, just period yeah. bar none. So, um, yeah, uh, I want to get, thank you to a super chat from Murray, by the way. Yay. Um, and then we got another super chat from West Texas Mike that says, I'm shocked that one of the things Riley said was uh, that he was slash we should be thankful for uh, uh, what was Alex Grinch was one of the first coaches to join him at USC. Yeah. I, I, he was all in on Alex Grinch. Yeah. He was all in on Alex Grinch and all, to, Alex Grinch to was a all fault. in on him. Yeah. yeah. And that was a fault and that was a mistake. It's clear uh, that mistake has been rectified. And he gets right. to go and and make a make a new hire and see where he goes from there and learn from this. I I think that it's it's in I think the thing that I find the most crazy, yeah, is how quickly people are writing off a coach who they are. I think comparing to coaches who have had time to learn and grow and fix mistakes and understand where they went wrong before. And acting like Lincoln Riley doesn't deserve that same time to figure it out. The Nick Saban comparison is always the one that I'll point to because Nick Saban took time. He he had a whole career at Michigan State. He had a whole uh you know several years at LSU before he broke through and figured it out. Uh, Pete Carroll famously had to fail and rethink his entire philosophy in order to come back and be a successful head coach. Kirby Smart couldn't break through at Georgia. He took over a program that was extremely strong under Mark Richt that couldn't break through at Georgia, and he took four or five years to get it right at Georgia to break through. Um, I, I, I I think it's insane to not sit back and say, this season is a failure, Lincoln Riley made a massive mistake on putting his faith in Alex Grinch. Yeah. Lincoln Riley needs to get his two point conversion decision settled in. Sure. Uh, but also there's no reason that he can't learn from these things, can't grow from these things. And if he doesn't grow or learn from them, I'll be at the end of the line there ready to criticize him for that. When it is appropriate to, to give up, on a coach like Lincoln Riley. It's not now. Yeah. It's not now. Eddie in the chat says, so should we lower our expectations? No, I I don't think you should lower your expectations. I I think for, you know, it is for me, we, we all decided that this team was not good enough weeks ago, right? Especially on defense, especially on defense weeks ago. So 
to me, we've are we've already come to that decision. We already know the defense is atrocious on defense. The, the the team is atrocious on defense. The 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 offensive line is not great. We learned this, if nothing else, against Notre Dame, right? And so I think it's it's a little funny to sit here and be like, but why aren't they better now? And it's like, well, we we knew they weren't better last week. And so, like, you know what I mean? Like, this is why the Oregon game t- t- tonight is so like. I I don't know that there's outside of you know us be having sort of beef with the with the two point conversion decision. This game was so struggy to me. Like SC was going in into a situation where they were they were not going to be the better team. You already knew that. We you already knew that SC was going to be beaten on the on the line of scrimmages that SC didn't have it there. Like you already knew those things. So why are you getting even more mad? Like you already know that those things are bad and they can't be addressed right now. This second, they have to be addressed in the next couple of weeks. I understand it's not cathartic to, to, to not have the, the, the thing, but like the Alex Grinch firing was cathartic, right? Like, so yeah, I, I don't think you should lower your expectations, Eddie. No, I, I don't think you should lower your expectations. Just be re- be realistic and reasonable. Yeah, your expectations should stay high. Those expectations turning you into a fire everybody every single year kind of person is not healthy. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, let's go back into the chat. So. Um, CJ says, should Caleb sit out the rest of the season in preparation for the NFL? No, I, 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 well, I say no, but I realistically like it's the UCLA game. It's one more game. That's it. it. I, 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 I would be shocked if he played another game for SC. That wasn't that. I think that he will sit out the bowl game Yeah, because that's, that's the day and age that we're in in college football these days. Um, but I would be shocked if he didn't play next week. And I would be shocked if he played beyond that. He's going to play next week and that's it. Yeah, but he's going to play next week. It's it's a rivalry game. It's a a game. Caleb Williams is not the kind of player who doesn't care about winning. Yeah. He played the Cotton Bowl when he shouldn't have played the Cotton Bowl last year. Yeah. Like, I think it's insane to think that he would be the kind of player who would say, oh, I'm shutting it down. Like, no, he's not shutting it down. Yeah. And he, and he probably he shouldn't play a bowl game that USC plays. But you know what? I also wouldn't be surprised at all if, if he decides he wants to play the bowl game because he's a competitor. Like, he's a competitor. Yeah. Um, Robin Murdy says, how do we improve our physicality on offense and defense? I, I mean... Well, you how, how long of a time do you have my okay uh, aside from the obvious you recruit more physical players yeah. you develop more physical players all of the sort coach of basic better. things yeah. if you just coach better the physicality of it all gets wrapped into that like it's you don't it, it's it's not a it's not a it's not a chicken and egg kind of situation well, i guess it is a chicken and egg kind of situation like are the physical teams more well coached or are the more well coached more capable of being physical? Like if you're just good at your job as a coach, yeah. your players will be more physical because that's part of the process of coaching them up. Like yeah. USC's corners are not physical right now because they're not being coached to know where they are supposed to be so that they can be physical against a, a receiver that they're playing. Like these are all hand in hand. So yes, just get better coaches. And the physicality will follow, in my opinion. Yeah, I I, I think physicality is synonymous with success. If you have yes. success, people will like your physicality. Yeah, like th- those those are just it's just part the, part yeah. of the deal. Yeah. Um, big time Vance says, uh, does the does the D coaches do they understand how to cover uh, a back coming out of the backfield? I mean, no, these they are do not. <laughs> These are questions. There's a lot of things they apparently don't understand or don't yeah. know how to how to teach the players that are on the field to understand. Yeah. Because the understanding 
of where anybody is supposed to be at any given time in this defense is clearly very lacking. Yeah. Peter in the chat says, uh, what are you talking about? Lincoln Riley's defenses were sad uh, at Oklahoma under Grinch. He lost a college football playoff game 60 through 28. To the greatest college football offense that has ever been fielded. Yeah. But also he lost the college football playoff game. Yeah. USC has not been to the college football playoff. Um, you got to get there first. He he also put up, uh, where was it? Like, yes, the, the defense. Yeah. I, I, in, in Grinch should not have been retained. We talked about it a year ago. Uh, Grinch probably in hindsight should not have been brought over with him to, to Oklahoma. But again, and I don't feel like we make this point a million times. He won 10 games every single season, like 10, 11 games made the playoff three times in five years at Oklahoma. Like Lincoln Riley was clearly, clearly doing something bad. I mean, something right. Even without the the bad defenses, even with the bad defense. So, yeah. Um, Kenny says, how would you rank the disappointing seasons in terms of most to least disappointing 2012, 15 and 13? 2012 is the top one because there was a lot, there was every reason to go into 2012 expecting good, good things to be happening. Mm -hmm. Um, Kiffin, it was year, it was year three under Kiffin. Yeah. Should have been the, should have been a standout year. Yes. There were areas where they took a back, took a, took, took a step back, but the, the way the defense took a step back in that season was just far beyond what you could have what you could have ever expected. I don't know if my perception of this season is just different than what I see from other USC fans. I came into the 2023 season extremely skeptical about the idea that USC could be a college football playoff contender because I knew that USC's play mm-hmm. in the trenches was just not going to be there because they hadn't had time but to we build didn't- up we didn't think that the offensive line was going to be this bad. though. No, no. But I thought the offensive line would take a step back from where they were in 2022 because it wasn't a bunch of veteran guys who'd been playing together for five years. Yeah, like, but, but we I didn't, didn't think, think it was going to be as that po- much of a step back. No. Yeah, right. But I but I came in extremely. I, I thought that the Pac-12, the, the goal should be to win the Pac-12 title and then give yourself a chance in the college football playoff. But I my expectations for this season were not college football playoff or national championship or bust. 2020, 2012, I certainly came in thinking that USC could win a national title. Yeah. I, I Like believing that. To, to me, I think 2012 and 13 are pretty even, to be honest. I, I think they're pretty even. They're almost the same exact season. They're very similar. Uh, Kenny says 2015 in here. I Do you mean 14? Because, no, because 2015 was the second year under Sark. Yeah, but I, I don't... 2015 is, I, I don't know. Maybe my, my remembrance of 2015 is so different because it just goes to hell so early on and they the start gets fired and whatnot. But like to me, 2014 is so much more the, the frustrating year though. A lot of that is hindsight. Yeah, um, but that was also year one under Sark. It was, it yeah. was frustrating, but it felt like USC could have been better. Yeah. But SC looked four. like they were going to be a top 10 team early on. They go on the road, they beat Stanford. They, yeah. E- either way, I think that one is lower on the totem pole here. Um, it's 2012 and 13. I think are pretty equal for me. 2012 and what? What about 20, 2013? Sorry, 2012 and 2023. 2023. Yeah. 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 Pr- pr- pretty equal. Um, Hemi says, um, I have a question separate from this game. Do you think all that USC needs uh, is an offensive coordinator? What other aspects of the team are struggling? Uh, it causes uh, Lincoln Riley to have to pay more attention to that. No, I I think so. Here's the thing: Lincoln Riley is an incredible offensive coordinator, and handing handing that off to somebody else is ultimately going to make your team worse. The way you solve all of the problems is if he doesn't have to worry about the defense because he's hired a defensive coordinator who can handle the defense and 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 take care of that and have it not be a big issue. Um, I heavily disagree with the idea that a coach who is as 
capable as Lincoln Riley as an offensive mind should ever give the reins away to somebody else. That is that is not the way that I would. Yeah, it. especially when we look at it, that Pete Carroll was USC's defensive coordinator. Yeah, and um, he should have been because he was the defensive. He was yeah. the one who that was his strength. Yeah, I I know that people want to retcon it that it was Nick Holt. Uh, it was not. It was not Nick Holt. Um, but like, yeah, I, I, I theoretically, I, I think a, an offensive coordinator could, could help, but a, um, I think having Cliff Kingsbury there is not, he's Cliff Kingsbury is not the offensive coordinator, but he's someone there to consult and offer opinions and all those things which to me is essentially what an offensive coordinator under Lincoln Riley would do, you know, like that, that's essentially what it would. So I, I don't think that that's completely different. My new cliff being here is a temporary thing. Like he's, yeah. he's not going to be here for the long haul. He's basically on sabbatical and it's just, he's not truly on sabbatical, but he's not. If he could, if he wanted another job, he would go take another job. If you know Cliff what I mean? Kingsbury was hired as USC's offensive coordinator, it would take all of two quarters before everyone said he should hand the reins back to Lincoln Riley. Riley needs to get back to the play calling. Riley, like it would just, it would, it would just be a, a, a just not worth it at all. Yeah. Lincoln Riley is. The SC head has coach bigger and issues. And the offensive coordinator, what he needs to yeah. do is hire a defensive coordinator. It's that damn simple. Yeah. Just hire the right defensive coordinator and all of this hemming and hawing goes away. Yeah. Uh, Angelo says worth asking was Bo Nix pressured at all tonight? No, I, I, I not often enough. No, I'm, and when I'm, he was, he could find a wide open receiver in broken coverage. Uh, SC was credited with one quarterback hurry tonight. Yeah. That's not Oregon it. was credited with four and three sacks. Yeah, I, I, that's, and they got way more pressure than that. Yeah, so that's what seven pressures, if you want to call it that. Um, oh, there was way more than seven pressures. It fe it felt like it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Miguel says USC feels like Nebraska now. I I, uh, I pulled up Nebraska for the record. After Nebraska fired Bo Pelini, six and seven, nine and four, four and eight, four and eight, five and seven, three and five, three and nine, four and eight, five and five. USC is not Nebraska, and what you see from Nebraska is exactly why I tell everybody who wants to jump on the fire Lincoln Riley train to get the hell off that train. Because guess what? The next hire you make could be Lincoln, could be Mike Riley, it could be Scott Frost, and have fun with that because I don't want any piece of that. Kaylee says, uh, late to the therapy, genuine question, why is Caleb's protection so poor? We know what the defense is, but if Riley has such a great offensive mind, why is the old line been consistently bad? Because USC lost three, uh, three or four offensive linemen, including two all American level guys last season. And the cupboard was utterly bare from the previous regime. So USC had to turn to the transfer portal to try and plug some holes because there was literally no other options. And the, players that they brought in to plug those holes didn't all work out. And I, I had a long conversation with Hitler day over at the quack 12 podcast this week. And he was telling me his theory is that you cannot rebuild an offensive line via the transfer portal. Offensive line is too much of a unit that, re that, that relies on chemistry and trust and understanding between players that have, that have known each other for long enough for there to be sort of that web of, of familiarity and that if you need to start more than one transfer portal guy on your offensive line, then you're basically screwed. And USC was starting three. Um, that's to me, the, 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 the gist of it. Yeah. The, what I have liked to see USC's offensive line respond better to the adversity this year. Absolutely. Uh, but it's also very difficult if the players that you have don't don't have it or aren't couldn't possibly have it having transferred mm -hmm. in and then have to play next to a revolving door of of guys who are 
who are not getting it done themselves. It's a very, very difficult situation to be put in. Um, and, uh, and, and I would, I will continue to argue that a lot of the complaints that USC had, that USC fans have about the offense in general are solved if the offensive line is just more stable, because if your quarterback's not running for his life on every other play, like Caleb Williams was today, yeah. your offense looks a lot less dis discombobulated, um, just by, by nature. Yeah. And at, at a certain point, I don't know what else they could have fixed when it comes to this offensive line, because I don't know. They lost Gina Canones to an injury. So on the off chance that he was the missing piece, he wasn't available. They've tried putting Mason Murphy in there. It's, it's still been discombobulated there. Literally all of the other options are true freshmen who you cannot possibly expect to be ready to step in uh, to play against a, t a team like or like Oregon at Autzen. Uh, it, it, I just, I think the offensive line of all of the position of all of the areas of the team that USC was going to live and die on luck. Mm -hmm. It was the offensive line and they didn't get the, 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 the role of that die. And it's the, it's the thing that I find people the least culpable for because the culpability on that lies with, Clay Helton's recruiting practices in the trenches. Um, yeah. Um, I, what went wrong with the offensive line? Uh, the guy that SC probably needs at left tackle was wearing a yellow jersey tonight. Josh Connerly. Um, SC has lost recruiting battles on the offensive line. Uh, they've made recruiting decisions on the offensive line uh, for several recruiting periods. Uh, that's the, the clay out in the offensive line. I thought SC benefited by having the COVID season by pushing it down the line and Lincoln Riley benefited from it last year because all those guys still had eligibility like, um, Voorhees and Nealon still had eligibility last year. And those guys were really good last year. Right. And so Lincoln Riley benefited of it. If it wasn't for the COVID year, then it would have been worse last year too. Um, because yeah, Lincoln Riley was getting a bunch of guys, like people were not happy about the the three star guys that SC was getting, right? But one of those three star guys panned out majorly in Andrew Voorhees. Um, and he was around for a long, long, long time. And all those guys ended up staying longer to give SC an extra year or two before it really came to roost. And it has come to roost. Uh, SC does not have the talent there on the on the offensive line, um, like Oregon does. It years and years of like going to try to get Penny Sewell and not getting him, going to get um, Jonah Tawanu Jonah, yeah. from from Narbonne, a guy that was on SC's campus for years. And they did not get him. Mind you, he goes to Oregon and ends up never playing and becoming a bust for academic reasons. But that's a guy you can't miss. Sean Ryan, a guy that goes to UCLA that SC, SC misses. Like these, these are guys that SC missed on that could have actually, that the, the, they could have used. I think there are guys where you can, it's one thing to go after Drake Jackson instead of, uh, cave on Thibodeau. I, I think Thibodeau, yeah, the better player, but like, I can understand if you valued one or the other and Drake Jackson was still good. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. but on the offensive line, those issues just SC lost those things. And SC doesn't have the, 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 the lines that, that Oregon has had on the offensive line. Um, and if they would have been able to get those guys, um, and if, and on top of this, I think not, I wonder how much Bill Biedenboe would have mattered. Bill Biedenboe, the best offensive line coach, at least we think, um, at, was at Oklahoma with Lincoln Riley. He did not come with Lincoln Riley from Oklahoma. Does that matter? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe he recruits different guys in the transfer portal, but it's Maybe. still... It's still a hole that I don't, I don't see the solution, the direct solution, because... When we looked at what USC 
did coming out of out of last season, it felt like USC had done everything they possibly could in terms of the available offensive linemen out there. So uh it I just think it's I just think that was a an impossible situation that was always gonna create a setback for the offense for the offense, which which by the way, USC still has one of the best offenses in the country. Um by every statistical measure. Yeah. So the issue is not necessarily like, yeah, USC's offensive line took a step back. We sort of anticipated that being the case. Maybe not this big, big of a step back, but still a step back. You could overcome that if your defense wasn't catastrophic. Yeah. You could have bought them some time. Yeah. And, and you didn't. I, I, you know, stupidly, I, I had a lot of faith in the faith in the offensive line because we thought they were going to be atrocious in 2021 and they were really good. Mm -hmm. They were really good last year. And so I thought SC had gotten to the point where schematically they could even overcome a bad defense uh, offensive line. Uh, I think that's been proven not to be the case. So I think we're a little bit wrong on that one. Um, LA Fred in the chat says SC is not a learn on the pl job place. When you come in, you're expected to be ready. Didn't we do this during the Helton era? Yes. I, I, I no, think, no, 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 well, no, hold, no, hold on, hold no, on. no, 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 because Clay Helton was never Clay Helton wasn't a coach who should have been hired at the G five level. Right. Let but, alone at USC. But hold on, hold on. I, that I, doesn't, just because just because we talk about hiring somebody who doesn't need to be getting their first opportunity before they've even proven that they could get hired at the G5 level doesn't mean that the coach that you bring in who has been a coach for five years doesn't have the grace to have to learn from some mistakes and grow. Every coach out there is learning and growing unless you're talking about adding Kirby Smart or Nick Saban, which you were not doing. Every single coach you brought in was going to have to be learning how to succeed at USC, whether it was Luke Fickle, yeah, I, Matt Campbell, any of them. I think there's nuance here, right? Like, I I agree. SC is not a learn on the job place in terms of yes, Clay Helton should not have been hired, and I think that you want to hire go out and find someone who's the finished article. That's exactly why they went and got Lincoln Riley, who had the resume that he did. Um, and even I think what we what we are learning is that even guys who have the resume that they do uh, still have room to develop. Right. And so, no, USC is not a job to learn, not a place to learn on the job because you don't want to. You don't want to go out and give someone an opportunity that, say, Memphis wouldn't have given Clay Helton. But at the same time, um, I think that Lincoln Riley should be allowed the, the liberty to learn from his failures, given that he's had successes there, and elsewhere. You know there's what I mean? also a giant difference between learning on the job at the most basic level, learning how to yeah. get your team bowl eligible. Versus learning on the job of learning how to turn, how to take the next, how to next take step, the next step yeah. to being a, t a, a national title winner. Like yeah. there's a huge difference between that. Yes. And, and the next step is the hardest one. It's, it's the hardest one to yeah. take. Yeah. It's, um, it's extremely hard to turn around. Like for instance, let's talk about Arizona for a second. It's extremely hard to turn Arizona around from being a doormat to being seven and three right now. And looking like the toughest out in the conference. Uh, but I think it's going to be even tougher for Jed fish to like take them from what they have to being say playoff level. Well, right. Like, it like it's, it's tough. It's very, and if he doesn't all the credit to him in the world, but like, it's very tough. It's tough to do that. It's not easy. This is again, why there's only like, I, I, I haven't, we talked about it. There's I think five coaches in America that have won playoff games. Right? Yeah. Uh, Saban, smart. smart. Jimbo Fisher, LOL. Um, Dabo. Dabo. And Orgeron. Well, he's not coaching. Well, not current. Okay. Yeah. R Ryan Day has won one playoff game. Um, the uh, 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 Sonny Dykes. Yeah, Sonny Dykes. LOL. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, and Har Harbaugh hasn't won a playoff game. No. So like 
there's only so many of those because it's so hard to get to the next level. Like, yeah. like, like the level of where to go from James Franklin to Kirby smart is so difficult to do that. But yeah. you, you, you hope that th- those guys do that's, that's, that's what you hope. You hope that Lincoln Riley gets to that next level. Yeah. He's been to the playoff three times. Yeah. He's gotten blown out in the playoff. Yeah. So is urban Meyer. So is like most coaches who have gotten to the playoff. It's about taking the next step. The next step is really difficult to do, but you got to be willing to figure out how to do it. Yeah. Um, you got, you got to, you got to figure out some way. Uh, Danny in the chat says urban Meyer available better than Lincoln. Re- urban Meyer is not going to coach again. I, he I, has said this 50,000 times. No. He is not going to come back to coach college football and a program like USC shouldn't look his way anyways. That same thing goes for Ed Orgeron. I want to put way. a sign up here that says, no, USC is not and hired. should not hire Ed Orgeron. Like, I just want to yeah. put it in big letters right behind us. Yeah. No, and just point to the sign. Just, no. 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 I know this is about Urban Meyer, but it's the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. It's the same, same no. disqualifiers, yeah. essentially. Uh, yeah. Miguel says, why didn't our receivers develop this year, especially Dorian Singer? That's, that's a valid question, I think. I, I will go down as saying I do not understand at all what happened with Dorian Singer. I don't get it. I can't explain it. I don't understand how a player as productive as he was at Arizona turned into someone so unproductive at USC, aside from... USC had other guys that they wanted to target. Yeah. And he being lower down on the pecking order meant that he wasn't as trusted by maybe he just never built a rapport with Caleb Williams. That I as the only thing I I got no clue. I got no clue. Uh what I do know is that Taj Washington is a baller and Brendan Rice is a baller. And I, I said this on, on Twitter, but that last drive with USC and Brendan rice was an example of something that I wish USC had maybe done a little bit more this season where I wish that Caleb had just trusted that he could just throw the ball to Brendan rice. I just let him go out and make a play. Let him, let him go out and make a 50 50. Yeah. I, I think that Brendan rice has it in him to make those plays. And I have been a little bit frustrated by, not just doing can, that. Can but you imagine Caleb Williams with the 2019 receiving core? It would be unfair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Drake London and Michael <laughs> Pittman and Tyler Vons and Amon uh, Ross St. Brown. Yeah. Those, yeah. That receiving core. Yeah. My God. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah I, 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 liked the it, it probably wouldn't have been my decision but this is why i don't make those decisions uh going right back to the same play on that third and fourth down that scored the touchdown in the fourth quarter but i thought it was a big swing and dick moment like just trust your instincts and hey we got the look we wanted let's go get it again mm-hmm. and i put the ball right here and he does Caleb Williams and and Brendan Rice, like we're gonna get it right this time, and they did. And like hat tip, like that was that was a great moment. Yeah, Brendan Rice in this game, five catches, eighty one yards. If you would have asked me, I would have thought it was way more. But I think almost all of that has to be in the fourth quarter. Yeah, yeah. And I just I think he's been capable of doing this, doing this all all season. I just I just think they haven't necessarily necessarily tried to force the issue because I, I, I think one of the one of the double edged sword elements of this offense is that it can be so effective at times through concepts mm-hmm. that I don't think you know, we we complained for a long time about the Clay Hilton offenses that they were so reliant on just an individual player uh you know popping up and, and doing something incredible and, and it was a lot of fifty fifty balls and and just uh, you know, let's see what Drake London will do. Yeah. And they didn't scheme anybody open ever. And I, and one of the things we liked about this, about experiencing the Lincoln Riley offense is that far more often somebody is schemed open. They're getting the ball to an open receiver, all of that. 
Mm -hmm. Which is which is great. But on when you're when your quarterback's getting pressured and your guys aren't necessarily getting wide open, yeah, I think there is more room for USC to say, okay, let's let the receiver make a play. Mm -hmm. And Caleb has been resistant to, I think, trying those. And I don't blame him because that's how you end up throwing interceptions and, you know, all of that. But, uh, you know, considering the ways that he's fumbled the ball because he's just held the ball too long a few times, yeah. I'd rather him not force something into a, into a tight window necessarily, but put a ball up that shows that he trusts the receiver is going to make a play. Cause I don't think we see a lot of those plays actually. Speaking of, um, plays and creativity, I thought all the little trick plays, gadget plays those today were, were, were great. Yeah. I, I thought they were, they were, I loved the option pitch that we saw a couple times too. Like there were a lot that, of things that I thought that I liked in this game. That pitch schematically. Re- that pitch reverse on a it was like almost like on a tilted angle. That was that was Loved that. super some yeah. really fun play design, some really cool things in, in the bag that you know, if if you weren't gonna pull them out now, when were you gonna pull them out? So I, I appreciated uh, a lot of those. But um Yeah. Uh, last thing, um, Danny in the chat says, let's be real though. Lincoln Riley is struggling with some basic stuff. He can't manage timeouts or a hurry up offense to save his life. Yeah. I was very, I like sort of not understanding why the, uh, there wasn't more urgency on offense, um, in the, the drive before the half, I, the, the first play, I think SC runs, uh, first, they get a first down the first play. And then they waste like almost 20 seconds, 25 seconds before they run the next play. You only have a minute and 40 seconds or whatever it was. You got to be quicker. I think those are one of the, the, the areas. And to Alicia's point that she made earlier, I just it, every single every game coach I watch, makes these issues. Every single game I watch, every single coach does. Is, and it's is mind boggling. This, this yes. Stuff. So I, I just don't find it to be surprising when it's happening to USC. The only yeah. difference is that when you're watching USC, you're you're emotionally invested in it. You start yelling, or if you're watching, you know Kansas and Kansas State, like you're not you're, you're not invested in it. Yeah, in the same way. You, That's not to. I'm not trying better. to yeah. excuse it necessarily. I just think this is far more common in college football than you think. Um, yes, but thing. but absolutely one of the areas that I think SC yeah, needs get to those, get needs those get those cleaned up. At. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jonathan in the chat says Ed Ogeron. And, uh, with that, we are going to end this. So no, no Ed Ogeron. The, the, the ship is sailed folks. It's sailed. It's gone. It is Bon Voyage. Uh, and we will be Bon Voyage too here on this, this car cast. So, uh, we'll be back Monday, uh, Monday night, 5 PM, um, to talk more about USC and Oregon, take your questions, open up the rant line. Uh, mailbag, whatever, uh, whatever we have. So until then, we will see you. Thank you guys, as always, for joining us. Uh, it's well after midnight. And there's a few hundred of you guys on. So this has been uh, awesome, and we always appreciate you guys. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, until then, final word, Alicia, anything? The final word is beat the Bruins. How about uh, beat the uh, citizens? Well, that's for you. Yeah. That's for you. Chelsea and sit eh. Sit eh. At uh, eighth uh, eh. Liverpool is playing somebody tomorrow. I don't actually know who it is. Wow. What a fan you are. I, I, I'll, I'll search for you. Brentford. Oh, Brentford. God. Yeah. Brentford. Beat, beat the Ooh. Brentford. That, that's the bees. Gonna be, the bees. That's going to be fun. Yeah. 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 Uh, no. Uh, up the blues for sure. Uh, until then, we will, we will see you. See ya. See ya.